previously on Zero Fluff. I'd like to uh, introduce our guest today, Steve Zalewski. I'm so excited to welcome you here. Uh, Steve Zalewski currently provides CISO and security consulting and advisory services. He was most recently the CISO at Levi Strauss and Company, where he was responsible for leading the company's global cybersecurity organization. Prior to that, Steve was the enterprise security architect at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, leading their security architecture team responsible for cybersecurity strategy and critical infrastructure protection. Other positions Steve has held include leadership roles in healthcare security and senior engineering management roles in storage networks, data protection, and operating system design. Steve also co-hosts the CISO series Defense in Depth podcast, which provides clear talk on cybersecurity's most controversial and confusing debates. And he's also a frequent speaker at industry events. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for this conversation. So we've seen cybersecurity grow as a function and opportunities for technology to come solve challenges in cybersecurity for the past you know, 15, 20 years. How how do you as a CISO keep up with emerging technologies and new solutions um, that that constantly become part of your purview? It's so funny. A friend of mine said the other day that there's not a finishing school for CISOs to make sure that you're aware of all of these new pieces and parts. How do you keep track or how do you keep a good handle on the things that need your attention? I can't. <laughs> the, the problem has has exceeded the capacity for any individual, no matter how intelligent, to be able to keep it all in their head. It's just not possible. At last count, I want to say there are approximately 6,500 security products and somewhere around 2,500 or 3,000 companies that are generating products. Okay, There are billions of dollars a year being invested by the VCs into security to be able to create new products. Well, I will tell you, there are not 6,000 problems in security that has 6,000 products, okay? There are a lot less. There's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of confusion, right? There's a lot of people trying to go after this market because it is a target-rich environment from the ability to sell product. And several years ago, and even when I was a chief security architect, there came a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. I can't. Which means a lot of the sales and marketing that is being thrown at me is no longer effective. I ignore it. I don't know. I, I, I can't, you just can't. Even if 500 companies come at you, Aaron, right? Trying to tell you that they're here to help you because their security widget does whatever as good as or better than anybody else. So how could you possibly not use my widget? As opposed to, hey guys, I only have so much money, so many people, okay? that I can't use you all and I can't track you all. I can't. So what's happening and what you see in the market, right, is I would, I would say the security village, okay, that's trying to raise the security child is dysfunctional right now, okay? That what we should be doing is we have a shared responsibility between vendors, right, and between the analysts and between us as CISOs that are trying to buy products to make sure that what we're doing is actually protecting us against the common enemy, which is the malicious bad guy, okay? And yet we're not. We're, to a certain extent, fighting amongst ourselves. We have different opinions. So the poor security child, okay, is not getting the love and attention to grow up to be a good, effective adult, right? We're doing a disservice. So I think part of this is an acknowledgement that we have to do that. Now, what does that mean in practice? It means that we rely an awful lot more on our networks, okay, our peer networks. Hey, what's worked for you? Hey, you know, here's my problem. And so because there's so much churn in the industry that, you know, the last 18 or 24 months is really all you want, we're relying more and more on each other and less and less on analysts and less and less on sales and marketing. And that's a bad thing, right? Because now it relies on our ability to have a network and that takes time and having the right people. I can't use the library of products per se because all of them look the same. Mm -hmm. So it's a real challenge right now. And the salespeople and the product marketers talk to us all the time. Hey, we want to take you to lunch or, 
hey, you know, will you spend 15 minutes and show us? The answer is we just don't have time. If I'm only going to buy three products a year, okay, in three years, that's nine products. That's not much. So to your point and why I kind of got went through that little, you know, uh, arabesque into all of that is, so what's happening more and more is the leaders are simply deciding in a given year, what are the key themes? What are the key problems that I need to address for the business? Where are the key vulnerabilities or exploitabilities? How is that translating into people process and then technology? And then within technology, what is that domain? And now I will go look at that domain, like advanced endpoint protection, and maybe look at the five or six companies at this point in time that are there. And the rest of the place, I pretty much ignore, right? Mm -hmm. I may talk to people, but for the most part, I'm really having to focus on the parts of the problem I need to solve this year, as opposed to being able to watch some of the larger themes and all the products that were out there and be able to spend more time participating in the direction. Now I'm pretty much just a consumer where I have too many options and not enough resources to help me make the right choice. Yeah. And as a marketing person who has been with technology companies for 20 years now, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we're top of mind so that when the priority gets set at the beginning of the year, we're at least top of mind. And it sounds like to me that that that's not actually how it's working. It's more that the priorities get set and then you do your research. Is that accurate? So, so <clears throat> here's the way I would position it. This is fun, which was when I was there. Every marketing person, every salesperson, and that's what I said earlier, right? Which is you've built this really cool technology. It solves a problem, right? Every product solves a problem. And it's a security problem. So therefore, every CISO obviously needs your solution to solve that problem, okay? But the real question, and I used to say to them is, don't tell me what you solve and then come to me and expect me to tell you all my problems so you can find a way to wedge your product into what I have in-house. That's what you're all trying to do. You want me to talk so that you can find a way to wedge in. And your marketing is all about trying to say, the sky is falling, let me help you. The way I used to tra tr transition that is you would come into me here and I'd say, here's what I need to know. I need to know how your product sells more genes. You tell me how your product sells more genes and then we can have a conversation because I'm not here to buy security. I'm here right, to provide a service to my company that I have to be able to go to my leadership and explain why I want to buy this product, okay? And you are not helping me because you're simply giving me the technology and I'm having to figure out how to make that transition. So I need you to start thinking like the business mm -hmm. and help me position your value proposition to the business. And if you do that, now you're helping me. Yeah, and it's so interesting when you're, Talk to me a little bit about how those priorities are, are are driven. Is it from the board level down or is it from your own understanding of like going back to your examples of you have your three types of CISOs, you know, the secure protect and then at the business level, it, it, are those driven by you and then you take them to the board for approval or does it really depend on the business and how it's run to your example about if you're talking at Google, the technology conversation is much easier because that's where they all came from. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that works because I think that from a marketing and sales perspective, it's, it's important in this conversation as well. Sure. So <clears throat> it's, it's a little bit feast or famine, okay? So let me talk about the famine side and then I'll tell you where the feast happens. Is in any IT organization, in any business organization, just like you, you go through an annual plan, okay? What do I need? Well, every CISO, and like we started with, has to decide how they wanna position the value of their organization and themselves against the key metrics that the company is going to compensate you on. Because at the end of the day, 
the metric everybody does is bonus, right? I always tell everybody. So how are you doing to make sure that you meet your bonus? If you do that, everybody's interested. I can do measurement around efficiency of tools. And then for the CIO and obviously for the CISO, then it's all about efficiency. But more and more, a CISO is responsible for the effectiveness of the tools against the attacks that are coming in. And that changes pretty dynamically, as you see. Every three to six months, there's what's happening in the world for the attacks, and there's what's happening against the perimeter of every company. So now I have to measure the effectiveness of my tools, not the efficiency of my investment over three years. Very different conversation. So what I try to do in most CISOs is you take a look at what you're responsible for protecting. You take a look at all the security controls, identity and access management, network protection, endpoint protection, risk assessments, governance, risk and compliance, right? And you apply some measurement to look at where the weak areas are. Maybe you do a security assessment and you have an outside firm come in and tell you what your perimeters are and what your maturity is so that you have to have a basis to decide what you need to improve. You're given a budget. You can fight for more budget or maybe less. And you put that argument together. Okay. The question then becomes, well, as it goes up the chain to the CIO and then to the CFO and potentially the CEO, if security is a cost center and you have to invest a certain amount, right, is how much do you give them versus the risk that you're accepting? And do you understand the risk that you're accepting? That's the hard conversation. Okay. And that what matures over time is the board's are becoming more and more aware of just how much cyber risk, okay, and ransomware is impacting their fiduciary responsibility. So you're getting more and more of a conversation that's around how effective is Steve being in the last six months against protecting the company against the threats, as opposed to how efficient is Steve being and making sure that an investment that he said he's going to have for three years, that he generates a maximum efficiency out of it. A CIO, Business application efficiency, that's how you measure. A CISO, got to kind of go back and forth. Now, that's how I kind of do the day-to-day. And you get a certain amount of money and you do the best you can. That's the famine. Here's the feast part. A breach happens. An incident happens. Okay? Something bad happens. All of a sudden, you're up there, maybe with the executive team. And you're covering that. And you're going through the incident response plan. Maybe I had ransomware. Maybe I had a phishing attack, compromise of credentials. You know, you can you can name them. Well, never let a good crisis go to waste when you can hold out your hand and ask for more money. Okay, so CISOs periodically always have that opportunity in order to be able to leverage those incidences to increase their budget. But here's the trap. If you take the money, you better fix the problem. Mm. And since a lot of times what we talk about here, right, people are fallible. And so your ability to manage your risk as a set of insurance policies really means, does the board understand when you take that money exactly what they are getting and what they're not getting or the executive team? What they're, for the most part, saying is if you take the money, you own the problem. And so you have to be very careful now going forward, a lot of CISOs, is you take the money but you've got to be able to have that conversation so that they understand that the risks that you are managing and those that you're not, right? That's what I always say, which is what's in scope and what's out of scope. Oftentimes out of scope is the more interesting conversation because it makes sure that the leadership team understands the risks that you are not able to address as a result of this particular incremental investment. Interesting. And I would say that is kind of a brief, we could talk much further because it's much deeper than that. But if I kind of give it at a high level, simplistic view, those are the conversations that we're having and how we do budgeting and how we can take advantage, right, of incidences when they happen mm. in order to be able to try to find that ongoing balance. And it's very dynamic and it is changing still, right? The role of a CISO is still very young. It's still changing in expectations. Risk management is still young. So it is a very dynamic environment and your ability to speak the different languages of the business and technology and everything really is where the role of the CISO is going. Interesting. And as a CISO, 
I would think that your team's ability to deliver whatever projects you decide are of priority is really important. And we hear every day that there are talent shortages. Um, have you seen that in the organizations that you've been at? And how do we overcome obstacles in the job market right now to ensure that we're starting to kind of breach that what seems to be becoming an even wider gap um, in talent within security. Yep, uh, you touch on a on a very important topic um, from my perspective, which was there is a huge talent shortage. Okay, I don't know what the numbers are, and most people will say when you look at those numbers, right? Everybody aims high. Everybody wants to make it a bigger problem. I actually think those numbers are low. Hmm. Because the ability to leverage security resources into a company is still being understood. People are looking at the traditional roles, not the ways we're going to have to adapt to be able to do that. That's the first thing. So it's huge. So what do you do? You beg, borrow, and steal. Okay. So the first thing you do is if you can find other smart people in your company that are interested in security, you take them. If you can generate inroads to be able to train other people through whatever you can do. You take them. You look outside the company. And one of the beauties about cybersecurity in the way it has kind of matured is for every cybersecurity professional that you find that has a background in security, you're going to find one that doesn't. Biology majors, history majors, philosophy majors, art majors, mechanics, it doesn't make any difference because a lot of what security is, is an, an innate curiosity and a commitment to execute, right? You want to fix it. And all kinds of people have those capabilities and they've chosen to apply them in different fields. Okay. So as I look at this and I go, we got this huge problem in the short term, that's what you've done. Now we have this conversation around, well, we have to improve the size of the workforce. And diversity is another important consideration because obviously if we're going to improve the workforce, there's clearly a certain uh, demographic lack, okay, when you look at this. And let's fix it. And everybody says diversity is the answer, okay? And it is. But what I, I want to say and, and what was a key differentiator for me is insecurity. People attack us all the time. So what diversity is really saying, and what I agree with is, I need as many different ways of thinking about the problem as I possibly can get. Because everybody that's attacking me is across the spectrum of diversity. Therefore, I need an equivalent spectrum of diversity to be able to stand how you think to know how to stop you, or to know how you think in order to protect you. Security awareness training, right? I need to know how that is impacting you in your role or how you interpret it, right? So that way I can best reflect it back in a peer way. And so therefore, once you understand that, at least for security, that's where we need all types, right? Military people, great, because they've already been trained about mission, right? And a lot of security is really we're protecting other people, right? It's a form of war. So you're mission oriented, you get what you have to do. Okay, those are great people. But for every one of those I need, I need somebody really good with security awareness training who's really good at empathizing and communicating to, you know, people that are creatives that are doing jeans or shoes or somebody who's out in a business process and selling insurance. Okay, they all have different perspectives. I need those. I need project managers because I have lots of projects. I need people that are just really good, you know, schedule oriented. I need a whole plethora of skills. I don't need people that are cybersecurity experts are going to be experts in cybersecurity, right? There's no job cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a field. There's all kinds of jobs in it. And everybody doesn't need a four-year degree in pen testing to do it. I need all kinds of people that exist in other organizations. I just need to be able to explain to them that I need those same skill sets in cybersecurity and not position it in a way that makes it sound so hard that people aren't willing to take the risk to come join cybersecurity. Hmm. 
I love that answer. I think that that's a way to overcome the challenges that we see and to get people excited about technical roles that might not have ever considered them before, to your point of of looking at biology majors and philosophy majors and, and folks that have been in business process. I think that there's a place for everyone in technology and cybersecurity. So that's I love that answer. Um, we talked a lot about how there's so many tools across so many, so many different uh, disciplines within technology. And we're starting to see now a bit of a, a convergence of a collapsing of certain pieces and parts of that. Gartner's talked about that a lot in the past few months where there's a convergence of solutions within similar areas of IT, identity being one of them. Um, do you feel like it's a welcome shift to have more capabilities within a single platform instead of having a ton of point tools? Or does that just make it even harder to make a decision about what you want to choose for your security stack? Okay. So I promised you when we had this conversation, we would talk brutal truth. And that <laughs> My objective here is not to push it, but to really talk about what's happening. Okay. And so I want to talk about analysts for a minute in, in an open fashion here. So again, it's just, it is what it is. Analysts, to a certain extent, are in the business of creating new markets, right? They're creating new areas because as you're developing technology, you as a marketing professional need to separate yourself from all the rest of the market, okay? So analysts are looking and they're trying to understand, are you tackling new problems? And in cybersecurity, it's a rich market to be able to define new areas that you're trying to protect or new areas that you're trying to secure, right? Cloud, when it came out, created a whole new perimeter that we had to protect. It's not necessarily that the security tools and the, and the concepts that we have are new. It's just, we have to apply it to a new perimeter. Therefore, we may need innovation, new sets of tools, okay? So what the analysts are doing to a certain extent are helping people understand as the defensive perimeter or as the stack of how business applications and how people do work change. Digital transformation is a wonderful term. It actually is a good representation of over the last four or five years and when COVID hit of an appreciation for our work styles and work habits have changed. And that has changed the responsibilities of both the business processes and the technologies themselves that underlie it. From a security perspective, it means instead of you working in your office, you may be working from home, okay? You started working from home. Then you realize I can work from home. I can work from anywhere. So now you start to work from mom's house or you go visiting because now that you're not in the office, it really doesn't make any difference where you are, okay? And then we went work from every, everywhere, well, work from anywhere, to what we're doing now, which is we're working everywhere. Your work-life balance, your ability to isolate work from home when you went home, it's not there. You're doing 10-minute time slicing between home and work, okay? So how do I change the business processes to reflect that? That's one job, right? How do I design genes when my creatives are not in the office and I need to do it virtually around the world? That's their problem. My problem is, okay, how do I protect you now? Because phishing and the attacks that you're getting are now happening at times of the day when your defenses are down mm -hmm. or you have other things going on because you're home and you might click or you're working from Starbucks and therefore I have to put bubbles around you, okay? That's what we're trying to do. Now, does that mean that the problems are fundamentally different? No. Does it mean the solutions I need to be able to accomplish that are different? Yes. And that's what's happening. So when I look at all these prod the products like you talked about and, and the fact that what we're doing, the system is working because everybody is trying to understand the consequence of changes to process, of which security ultimately has the job of never failing. Right? Business can fail fast. Try to sell something, it doesn't work, move on. But security can never fail. But when the perimeter of what we're trying to protect is constantly evolving and moving, okay, it's hard for us because 
On one hand, we have to tell you we're secure. On the other hand, we realize the business is moving everything and it takes me a certain amount of time to reestablish where the business has gone because they don't necessarily tell me. Digital transformation is an enablement of business to move faster. Security isn't necessarily in that conversation. Okay, so what I see and what I continue to see and will happen for a while yet, right, is as business changes, the security requirements are morphing, the expectations of security are changing, the tools that we need, the way to do that are changing. But ultimately it comes down to this, okay? I would like to be able to have a single pane of glass to be able to understand how I am protecting the company, setting the policies for it, and being able to monitor. Okay. The way I look at it is every time we're doing this, my simple analogy is hey, in the old days, you used to go to the butcher shop, then you went to the bakery shop, then you went to get soup here, then you went, okay, everyone was specialized and you went there to do it. All these tools are specialized. But what I need is a supermarket. I need to be able to go to one place to pick it all up so I can have a single list. And ultimately then I get one receipt of everything I got and I can monitor what I'm buying over time. That's the analogy as we're moving from all the individuals to single, but now we're adding more and more products. And the products initially show up as new stores, not necessarily in a grocery store, and I want them to move into the grocery store. So mm. I have a unified view of what to do. That is kind of the ecosystem. And we're heavy into the innovation because so much of the, of not the security technology, but the process of business is changing. Mm. And therefore security being 20 to 25 years old is still very immature. It's going to take a while. And that's the challenge we're all on and why we need smart people and why it seems like it should be a relatively straightforward problem to solve, but people are the core of everything we're doing here. And you can't tell people what to do. You know what I mean? So you have to adapt. Right. Well, I think that there, it seems like it could be easy, but it's not simple. It's a very complex issue. Um, and as things continue to to move and, and evolve over time, it doesn't get any less complex. And so I think it's, it's just an interesting thing that we'll have to keep talking about. <laughs> and I would say it will get simpler over time. Okay. Um, and I have to use analogies because, you know, I'm, I'm looking into the future. Part of what I do is I'm looking 18 or 24 months away on the technology of evolution, but I'm looking at what business is doing. Okay. So you, you have to know, the, the business of security and the security of business, right? Those are the languages that effectively I'm talking here, which is risk frameworks, right? How do you manage risk and security? What is appropriate risk, okay? Back in the 1800s when they were building steam engines, okay, they didn't know what they were doing. They were blowing up all the time. It was the insurance companies that actually sat down and wrote the book on how to build a steam engine because they didn't want to have to pay out. And that took years and years and years. Over time, as we got better, we started to formalize. There's expectations on different roles in cybersecurity. There's expectations on how to measure. We're just so young that we're still trying to figure out the books. Mm. Okay? So it will, over time, get simpler and more standardized. But we're still so early in the innovation. that That's what Cloud effectively showed was we thought mainframes was the role was, and we were done. Then we thought mini computers and we were done. Then we thought laptops and we were done. Now we've got cloud and we think we're done. And then we got quantum computing. So all of this evolution and innovation is happening in parallel with us trying to mature the security practice. Mm. And that's what's so exciting, right? I leave it as what an exciting field. We need lots and lots of smart people to be able to do this, right? We've got lots to learn and lots to do. So, but that's when I get back to the, hey, we're a village that has to raise a security child and we have to protect them against the bad guys. So let's understand in this new, you know, maturation that we're going in, let's understand we have a responsibility to help each other, right? To be able to do this. And that's part of what we're all trying to understand and play our role. That's it's a great message and I think it's a wonderful place to stop. 
Thank you so much for joining me today, Steve. I feel like I could talk to you for a th three or four more hours, but knowing that a podcast has just a short time, we're going to cut it there. Awesome. Aaron, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. Really enjoyed it as well. Awesome. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe using your favorite podcast app. We are hosted on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, many other podcast platforms. We're adding new episodes monthly, and I really hope you'll join us again. Until next time.